So welcome to the UVM Extension Center for Sustainable Agriculture Pasture Program and New Farmer Project webinars. Um, this two-part presentation includes the 2011 updates on marketing and selling raw milk in Vermont presented by Jared Carter and best management practices for raw milk handling presented by Dan Scruton. Uh, there will be a short break between these two presentations, um, so uh, bear with us as we make that transition. Um, also joining us today is Jen Colby. She's the coordinator of the Center for Sustainable Agriculture Pasture Program, and she'll be moderating this session. Um, so our first presenter today is Jared Carter. Uh, Jared is the director of Rural Vermont. He brings his skills as an attorney to work with farmers and consumers to create a vibrant ag economy in Vermont. Rural Vermont has worked for several years to support legislation that allows farmers to sell raw milk in Vermont, and we're pleased to have him with us here today. Um, welcome, Jared. Hey, thanks for having me. I, I should add, I meant to say this before, um, just for our participants to know, do use the chat box if you have any uh, questions as we go along. That's t on the left of your screen. You can just type in there and hit send. Um, also, we have some uh, happy icons underneath the list of names. You'll see a green check and a red X. Um, if uh, the presenter asks you a yes or no question, you can use that that green check to indicate yes, or um, the red X to indicate no. And also, um, we have you know a happy face and a sad face if you are um, understanding or not understanding something that's going on. Um, use those, but also just feel free to type your thoughts or questions in the chat box. So take it away, Jared. OK. Um, well, certainly, thanks for, uh, for organizing this. Uh, to, to all of you, and, and uh, welcome thus far to, to Heather and Megan. Um, this is my first webinar experience, so please uh, bear with me as I, uh, I truck through this really important stuff. Um, anyway, I'm Jared Carter. I've been the director here at Rural Vermont uh, for about a year, in fact, a year uh, this October 1st. And in case you aren't familiar with us, Rural Vermont is a, is a nonprofit advocacy group um, for farmers, essentially founded in 1985 with the real mission of, um, of economic justice for farmers. Um, we exist to amplify the voices of farmers on agricultural policy issues, and in recent, recent years we've really spent a lot of time um, on working on this to, to, to increase uh, opportunities for small scale production and, and the direct sale of farm products. Um, Today, what we're going to be talking about is, is Act 62, the raw milk law, um, which governs the production and sale of raw, raw milk in Vermont. But kind of before I, I jump into that, I'd, I'd love to get a sense of, uh, of, of you guys' backgrounds. Um, and I'd certainly encourage you as I go through this to, um, although you can't um, audibly, audibly uh, ask questions, you know, type in your questions as we go. Um, and, and uh, hopefully I can answer them. And, and I'd, again, I'd encourage um, Dan, as I mentioned, to, to jump in whenever you'd like to, to, uh, to help. But um, I guess just sort of starting out, I'd, I'd be interested to hear, um, or not hear, but see Heather and Megan, um, whether you guys are, are currently milking. Um, maybe you hit the little green checkbox if you are. Um, great. So, so both of you are different, coming at this from different spots. Um, now, Megan, are you? Uh, how many animals are you milking? Are you milking less than five? And uh, or more? I'm just trying to get a sense of it. And I'd love to see. Uh, you know, if you're interested, type in uh, where you're where you're coming from, and uh, we can get to know each other all a little bit better. This is an interesting. Uh, format take a few minutes to get used to, but uh, great. Well, great to have you guys. Um, maybe sort of I'll I'll just sort of back up a little bit and and give a um, review of sort of rural Vermont and the and the raw milk campaign as we call it, and and uh, and then sort of jump into. I'm going to try to do sort of the hundred hundred thousand foot overview of the of the law afterward, and and I know Dan's going to get into some some more of the details. Um, so just kind of to give you guys the background, um, sort of the overview of Rural Vermont's raw milk campaign, um, and I'm going to try to get through these slides and time it uh, 
properly with when I'm talking about it. But uh, the, the background on on the campaign is um, it says 2005 there, but actually in 2004 um, we were approached by farmers across the state really who were interested in, in selling raw milk to their communities and finding ways to um, increase the, the, these connections and, and sort of break down barriers that were making it difficult for them to do that. And so after meeting with this group of folks, um, we really decided to launch a raw milk campaign with the overarching goal of, of making it easier to buy and sell raw milk in Vermont. Um, over the years, we've worked with this dedicated group and diverse group, I must say, you know, farmers from across the state to really identify the goals that, that people had and, and design a strategy to, to try to achieve those goals. And, uh, you know, that led to, um, in 2008, um, working to help lift the, um, a ban on advertising um, of raw milk, which essentially allowed farmers to then start to promote these sales via posters or in the newspaper uh, or, or other media. Um, and, and also doubling the quantity that could be sold from the farm from, from 25 quarts to 50 quarts. And I might just add, um, you know, this was, these were sort of all, this part of the campaign was, you know, long before I came on board. Um, so I don't necessarily have specific, wouldn't be able to answer specific questions about that, but um, it was a, a really a long, long process of, of bringing people together and, and trying to find the best way forward for the, to, to increase the sales and, and bring economic opportunity in, in that respect, economic justice to farmers. So in 2009, uh, Royal Vermont continued to work and, and lobbied the legislature for the passing of the unpasteurized raw milk bill, um, which is what we're going to talk about here. Um, that was passed. And, and I think the new law recognized the economic potential that uh, raw milk sales can bring to the farm, while also ensuring that Vermont's raw milk supply is both high quality and safe, which are obviously extremely important uh, aspects to this. Um, and again, before I, I sort of jump into the overview of the law, um, it was uh, tweaked a little bit more this past legislative session. Um, when Royal Vermont and, and the agency and, and other constituents worked together to, to pass amendments to the raw milk law, um, which specifically allowed for the sale for, for personal consumption and, and thus allowing the classes that Royal Vermont and other folks hold around the state, teaching people how to um, make products, dairy products, out of their raw milk, um, allowing them to, to do that in, uh, in, in, a, in a, an appropriate manner. Um, so that's sort of the, the background on the, the campaign um, around raw milk and, and the genesis, again, as I said, has always been uh, economic opportunity for, for farmers and finding ways to, to uh, grow that vibrant local food system through those connections and through those economic opportunities. So I'd, you know, I'd welcome you to, to chime in if you have any questions about the campaign at this point. Um, otherwise, I'm going to kind of start to roll through an overview of what the current law is. Um, and I'm primarily going to focus uh, on Tier 1. I, I don't know if you guys are familiar. Just to, by checking those boxes again, are, are both of you at least somewhat familiar with the raw milk uh, law, or is it um, completely new? If it's new, check, uh, check green. If it's not completely new, um, check the red. OK, so it's, it's brand new to you. Great. Well, then you came to the right place. Uh, um, Essentially, and, and I'll get into a little bit more of the details, I'm not going to go super in-depth um, because I think Dan's going to do more of that, but essentially um, when the raw milk law passed, uh, it set up two different tiers uh, for the sale of raw milk um, and, and set a, a standards that uh, all raw milk producers are expected to follow. And the bulk of these standards are considered to be best practices by many farmers. Uh, and were suggested and supported by the group of farmers that, that we are working with uh, across the state to, to try to open up these opportunities. Um, now, obviously, with any legislation, you know what uh, the ideas that you start out with aren't necessarily always the the um, the end result, and that's the nature of our our legislative and democratic process. I think this is all sorts of 
folks that uh, want to participate, and, and, and that's an important part of it. Um, so certainly the, the law isn't perfect, but I think it does, and we think it does create um, new opportunities for dairy farmers to take advantage of the uh, growing demand for, for raw milk. Um, so let me see here. Um, I'm going to launch forward. So okay, so here we are, Act 62, as I said, establishes a set of basic standards that all farmers selling raw milk are required to um, follow. And as I said before, it sets it up into those two different tiers, as you can see by the slides. Um, and those tiers are defined by the amount of raw milk that a producer sells. Now, I'm going to probably focus more on the tier one, since it sounds like um, uh, that would be more relevant to, to both of you, particularly starting out. Um, However, the, the act does apply to all raw milk producers, regardless of how much or little milk you're selling, uh, and regardless of what type of animal uh, you're selling, whether it's a goat, a sheep, or a cow. Um, so do I have, is, are there any, any questions thus far? I don't want to get rolling here and, uh, and make you feel like you guys can't chime in with questions, um, but feel free to type them in if, if you do. Um, otherwise, um, as I said, the, the law establishes standards that all raw milk producers are expected to follow. Now for tier one, which is the, the up to 50 quarts per day folks, um, there, are certain re there are certain requirements. One of them, uh, which, which are also included in tier two, but they're a little, a little less uh, onerous, shall we say. Uh, for the tier one producers, um, there isn't a requirement that you, you register with the Agency of Agriculture. I know that was something that was uh, important to folks uh, when this, this law was passed. Um, uh, however, you know, it should be kept in mind that, that under the law, the agency does have the, the authority to come and inspect uh, to ensure compliance with Tier 1 requirements that I'll kind of touch on at any time. So it, it is important uh, not only from a sort of a regulatory legal perspective to, to, uh, to meet these, uh, but also because, you know, they are um, sort of best practices, as, as Dan will go, go into. So uh, I'm kind of jumping right into it. Uh, tier 1 folks, so the, the folks up to 50 quarts per day from the farm, uh, all milk must be, must be sold directly from the farmer to the end user. So in other words, uh, not retail, uh, no middlemen, no customers buying gallons and reselling them or, or anything like that. It really must be uh, directly from your farm. Uh, to the consumer, um, at least at, at the tier one level, uh, which is uh, which was an important part of the law. And um, on that same note, samples of the milk can only be uh, given out at the farm. Uh, I think there was when the law passed. I I, I believe again I wasn't wasn't here, but I, I do believe that there was concerns about um, you know if the milk was at farmers markets, uh, kids would. Would, would get a hold of it without parental supervision and uh, et cetera. So it was really focused on directly from the farmer to the consumer. Um, uh, in addition, obviously, the animals must be housed in a clean and, and dry environment. Um, and there were a series of, let me advance these slides here. I apologize if I keep forgetting to do it. Um, so yeah, here here's some of the, the basics that I just touched on, uh, again, reiterating the direct from the farmer to the end user um, and, and sold from the farm. Free samples only permitted at the farm and, and animals must be housed in a, a clean and dry environment. Um, in addition to that, um, for the tier one folks and for the tier two folks, um, but, but uh, there were specific animal health and, and testing requirements. Um, as you can see from the slide, there were tuberculosis, or there are tuberculosis and, and brucellosis testing requirements. Um, the law explains that uh, milk must be derived from healthy animals uh, receiving adequate veterinary care, including TB and, and brucellosis testing. Um, the test should, of course, be done prior to selling uh, any raw milk, and, and the results of those tests must be posted uh, in a place that's easier, easy for your customers to see. Now. Um, Maybe you're asking, um, well, Vermont's a, a TB and brucellosis free state, right? Um, so why is this part of the, the law? Um, well, it, while it is true that uh, the state of Vermont is, is considered to be, I believe, TB and brucellosis free, um, it doesn't mean that there haven't been cases 
uh, in, the, in the past and, and in the recent past. And so this requirement is to make sure that uh, we don't jeopardize uh, that, that status, which is obviously extremely important to uh, Vermont's dairy uh, industry. Um, so that's the TB and, and brucellosis uh, testing. And, and as I said, it's, it's something that uh, all animals in the herd must be uh, tested with uh, annually. Um, there's also the, the rabies vaccination requirement. Um, and this is included within the same paragraph of the statute that talks about uh, TB and brucellosis testing. Um, now, my understanding, it's not required that the vet administer that this vaccine, uh, but that the vet must, your vet must certify that, that it has indeed been done. Um, some vets will do this, others will not. You just should check with your vet um, before giving the, the vaccination yourself and, and, and see how, how he or she does it. Um, it's up to your vet, uh, my understanding under the law, it's up to your vet uh, to decide how often the, the vet rabies vaccination uh, needs to happen. Uh, but again, as with the TB and brucellosis testing, um, uh, it needs to be uh, all the animals in, in your herd need to be vaccinated. So um, and again, it, it obviously should be done before selling milk, and, and the results must be posted in a place your, your consumers can see. Now, I, and I just sort of backing up again, I think a lot of the, 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 say the, the premise of all this law is an idea of, of uh, intelligent consumer, buyer, buyer, the buyer beware idea. And so there are a lot of things within the law that um, talk about giving the consumer the information um, you know, that they, they need or want in order to be able to make a, a decision about buying this product. And, and so the posting of these sorts of things are, are uh, an important part of that. Um, so that the, the, the rabies vaccination part was also uh, included. Um, now you can see that there's also a water testing. Um, it's federal law that uh, if you're selling any food product, uh, then you must test for potable water. And the legislat legislators that passed this law obviously wanted to make sure that people who wouldn't otherwise know about this requirement would be uh, aware of it. So it was specifically included um, in, the, in the bill. And I believe it's once every three years, the water must be, uh, must be tested, or as often as you work with, uh, with your water system. Um, I believe free testing is available to the Association of Conservation District. Uh, or you can do it yourself with a water a testing kit from the Department of Health. I believe there's other, other labs that do that as well. Um, and if your water does come back with high bacteria counts, um, then you'll need to, to sort of shock your system and retreat it and until it comes within acceptable levels. Um, and I know just, again, stepping back, that as I kind of walk through this, it's, it's, it sounds like a lot of stuff. And there are important things in here, um, of course. Um, but I think. We do have a seller's guide that you can that you can get from us, and it's, it's linked to our website, which I'll share at the end. Um, that really lays it out, and I think when you see it in front of you, it, it makes it seem a lot less daunting than it might sound when I blather on uh, about it for the next, uh, I guess, uh, 25 minutes. But um, I certainly encourage you to, to reach out, and, and I'm happy to get that to folks. Um, so again, then there's the antibiotic testing. If you treat your animal with antibiotics, and the milk must be tested and found to be clear clear of antibiotics before uh, you can sell the milk. Um, I think that's about it on the, the testing and vaccination. I'm going to forward on this slide. And if you have any questions, again, you know, feel free to type them in. Um, obviously, the point of this is to, to educate folks to be able to do this, open up these economic uh, opportunities. So um, milking. All milking, of course, must happen in a, in a clean environment, in a place that, that can be kept, kept clean. Um, you know, it wasn't specifically spelled out, I don't believe, in the law, but the, the, um, it is important that the, the, the location is very clean. For example, grade 8 dairies uh, require cement flooring. Um, specifically, uh, I don't think, believe the, the raw milk law has um, that level of detail, but it, but it must be done in a place that's clean and can be kept clean. So that's, that's extremely important. OK. Uh, milking equipment. You can see this great photo of some, 
some nice milking equipment. Um, all of that, of course, must be uh, of sanitary construction and clean, sanitized prior to milking. Um, you know, this can be done in, in several ways, and, and I'm guessing Dan will touch on that, so I won't get too into the details. Uh, but equipment, you know, must be must be clean and, and sanitary. So let's keep trucking here. Um, milk handling. Um, the milk must be cooled to 40 degrees Fahrenheit within two hours of, of finishing. Um, I think most farmers agree that this is a is a good idea and, and important um, to make sure that the, the milk is uh, safe and, and that it, it uh, increases the milk shelf life, of course. Um, and in addition, a, a composite sample must be taken daily of the milk and, and kept for 14 days. Um, this was a was an important requirement um, of the of the law, and I think it gives that sort of traceability um, and being able to check um, back if if the need ever arose um, to do so. That having these samples is is an important uh, part of this. Okay, record keeping and custom relations. Well, record keeping um, anytime you're you know, engaging in a business, it's good to keep records, and the law specifically provides what sort of records must be kept. Um, customer contact list is required uh, so that the farmer knows, or so that you know, um, everyone is buying buying your milk, um, and that list must be must be maintained so that if God forbid something uh, did occur, you'd be able to um, contact that person and in, 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 in an appropriate manner. Um, the customer contact list can be used for marketing and customer relation purposes too. Uh, in other words, um, it doesn't have to be um, just for you know a transaction record. You can make this part and parcel with your customer list and your customer contact information that you might use to reach out to your customers. So, um, in addition to that, there's transaction records. Um, Obviously, as with any business, transaction records are, are an important part piece. Um, with with raw milk, the the uh, sales must be recorded and kept on file for one year. Uh, this doesn't have to be a specific type of um, record keeping book. It can be a notebook uh, in the milk room where where the customers fill in their names and the dates of the amount of milk purchased each time they visit. Uh, so it's not a, a hugely onerous process. Um, and so I, I think again just. Jumping back, obviously, this transaction record combined with a customer list provides a level of protection to the to the farmer in the event that the um, customer calls complaining that, that he or she is sick or something of that nature. Then the farmer can revisit this transaction record to see when the milk was purchased and, and who else might have purchased on the same day and use that sort of preventatively uh, to reach out. So uh, I think this, this makes a lot of sense and um, fits, fits within um, you know, the, sort of the best best practices that, that Dan's going to talk about. So in addition to that, um, record keeping and customer relations, you see that uh, there's something there about giving tours. Under the law, the farmer is required to give a, a tour uh, of the, the farm before an individual purchases the milk. Um, and the tour should include, quote, uh, the farm in any area associated with the milking operations. Uh, and customers are, are welcome to come back and, and re-inspect uh, at, any, at reasonable times, but uh, essentially this is the again the sort of the buyer beware mentality that um, giving folks a tour of the farm and, uh, is well not only potentially fun and educational, but uh, also gives them a sense of where the milk's coming from and, and the process, and, and makes them be able to make an educated decision. Um, and just touching on that, um, something that's worked well uh, for farmers that we've talked to is to op offer these open farm evenings, so to speak, um, where all prospective mills customers are invited to a tour. Um, and this allows the farmers to kind of get it all done with one fell to fell swoop, so you're not constantly giving these tours if that's not what you're into. Um, and it can be a great marketing tool. I think, obviously, in, in Vermont, um, folks are wanting to know where their food's coming from and kind of. A Increasing that connection is uh, is wonderful. So um, that's another important piece. Keep moving along here. I'm looking at the clock. Are there any other any questions thus far? Feel free to type them in. I'm, I'm reading that box. So okay. Um, bottling raw milk. 
Okay, so here we go. Tier 1 producers can uh, either fill bottles themselves or allow customers to fill their own. But, but do note that if you do allow your customers to, to fill their own, um, the responsibility is on you to make sure that it, uh, the bottles are clean. Um, that's, I think that's just sort of a side note uh, if that's the route that, that you do decide to go. Um, next here we'll talk about uh, labeling milk. Labeling, again, this idea of, of uh, consumers being able to know what they're purchasing. Um, that buyer beware, again, um, it was part of that. And so there's a, a labeling requirements, which I, I would say that um, Rural Vermont does work with farmers. Um, we have templates on our website for these labels, um, as well as for the sign that I'm going to quickly touch on. So I would encourage you to reach out to us, and I'll put up that slide at the end. Um, and I'll type in our contact info here at the end as well um, if you want help with this, with uh, meeting the labeling requirements um, for the bottles and for the, the sign that's required to be in the in the uh, in your uh, store or barn. Um, so as you can see, this this milk here has a, a nice label on it. Um, now all milk that is sold, all raw milk that is sold, must be labeled and, and include um, the following information. Um, date the milk was obtained, contact info for the farmer, uh, name or picture of type of animal that the milk comes from, uh, and in one inch lettering, this was specific to the size of the lettering, must say unpasteurized raw milk, not pasteurized, keep refrigerated, end quote. Um, and in at least one sixteenth inch lettering, a warning about the supposed dangers of, of raw milk. Um, so there were fairly specific requirements within that, but as I said, um, we're happy to help you with the template um, and, and making sure you're, you're meeting those requirements. Okay, now, I, I hinted at this a few moments ago, but there is uh, the farm sale sign, excuse me, requirement as well. Um, so this is another um, another thing that you must have displayed for consumers. Um, essentially, it's it's a uh, unpasteurized raw milk warning sign with one inch letters. Uh, displayed where it'll be visible to your customers uh, with, with the same language that is required on the labels, um, uh, which again, we have the templates for this. In fact, we have the signs that you can see right there, um, Rural Vermont has, and, and we're happy, uh, happy to get them out to you um, so you don't have to kind of create, recreate the wheel. Um, we're happy to help get those out to you if you, you know, when you start um, selling raw milk. Um, so that's essentially uh, where that where that comes from. And again, it, it says uh, if, you, if you can't see it in this very well, but the sign says, um, "quote unpasteurized raw milk, not pasteurized. Keep refrigerated. Uh, this product has not been pasteurized and therefore may contain harmful bacteria um, that can cause illness and." Um, particularly in children, the elderly, and persons with weakened immune systems, and in pregnant women who can, women can cause illness, miscarriage, or fetal death, or death of a newborn. That was specific language that the, the legislature uh, required, um, uh, and, uh, and so in conforming with the law, we're certainly happy to get the, that stuff out to folks to put up uh, in, their, uh, in a place where the consumers can see it. Um, so that's essentially the, the tier one um, kind of 100,000 foot level, um, and it sounds like from the two of you that's where you'd, you'd be at. I will just quickly touch again from a very um, a higher, sort of higher level, what the tier two um, requirements are. Uh, in other words, the folks that are selling uh, more milk. Uh, one of the things about when you hit uh, tier two, if you want, um, and you meet their, the requirements, their, the added benefit is that you are allowed to deliver your milk uh, to the consumers. Oh, I'm getting a question here, Megan. Let me, let me read it here. Yeah, um, I'm, I think uh, Dan will probably be getting into um, uh, the details of the, the required bacterial testing. Uh, so if, if it's all right, we might just hold that till later. Um, and then in terms of uh, Heather, your question, is that a question or just a statement? You're, I think you, you're certainly welcome to, to go about, about it in that manner. 
um, as long as you're meeting the requirements, um, then a, a CSA model is, is would, would meet the law, is my understanding. If that's if that's kind of your question, um, I guess if you want more clarity, okay. Is this within the tier one level? Okay, so the the um, we can skip back to that that slide, and I can can show you exactly um, in terms of the the amounts here. Okay, so tier one is up to 50 quarts per day uh, from the farm. So as long as, and I can't do the math just right off the top of my head, um, as long as you're you're not selling more than that uh, a day, then you would be within the tier one requirements at 50 quarts per day. Um, if you do go above that in, in that in that um, CSA model that you're talking about, then you would have to have to hit the tier two requirements. So if you look at the slide, um, I can't just off the top of my head remember exactly what the conversion from quarts to gallons um, is. I think, um, Jared, I, what I'm seeing the confusion is at uh, at one to two gallons per week. You know, on a given day, she would be over that 50 quarts. However, if you average it over the week. She would be under um, uh, the, you know, way under a tier two of 40 gallons per day. So, um, you know, her average for the week might be. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't know. Maybe that's... Dan might be able to shed some light there as to whether you know you you average your product your sale yeah. over the week or is it on any given day that you can't sell more than that. Um, no, this since, is, you know, this CSA is... distribution is you know usually once or twice a week. This this is Dan. Yeah, the the way the statute's written, it's per day, not average, over the week. So, in any given day, you couldn't sell more than 50 quarts. But I did do the. I got a calculator here, and it's like 45 quarts a day, if you had 40 CSA members at two gallons a week. So it could be done within the 50 quarts. If you go over the 50 quarts, I'll answer Megan's question while we're right here too, because I, I wasn't planning on talking about it. It's only tier two that needs to do the bacteria testing. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. That's that's helpful. Did that did that answer? I guess green check marks if that answered you guys' questions. Okay. Okay. So um, let me get back to the slide that I was at. Megan, did that work for you? Did, did we answer your your question? Or should I should I go on? I don't see a green check, but uh, I think it worked. Okay. So um, when am I when was I supposed to wrap up again? That'd be at um, uh, twelve thirty by twelve thirty today. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I guess I will um, will touch on the the tier two uh, tier two overview here um, since that that clearly was was brought up. Um, so for tier two, uh, in addition to the, the the tier one requirements that we touched on, um, and if if you want to deliver milk, in other words, or you go above that that uh, Court amount, um, you must meet uh, you know several additional requirements. Uh, but first of all, um, if you do deliver, it can only be uh, within Vermont. Uh, your customer has to pay in, in advance for the milk, uh, either through a one-time payment or through a subscription. Um, we, we of course recommend that you keep track of, of the payments on the customer contact sheet and keep track of the deliveries on your on your transaction sheet. Um, the milk that's being delivered uh, must be must be kept at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or colder uh, at all times until the, the customer receives it. Um, now, there's different ways this can be done. One one good way might be to set the containers in a cooler with a 50-50 mix of ice and water. Um, of course, be sure that the water line is, is below the lip of the jar, but um, that is that is one of one of the requirements. The delivery must occur at the customer's home. Um, you can deliver the milk directly to the customer, 
uh, or you can put it in a cooler or refrigerator at the customer's home as long as it will be kept at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or colder until the customer gets it. Um, you must protect the, the milk from exposure to sunlight. Um, and, and you can, though, contract with somebody else if you don't feel like being the person that delivers it and the kind of economies of scale makes it work for you. You can contract with someone else to deliver your milk uh, to your customers if the person who, who contract uh, with you, however, does anything wrong, that, that is your fault. But you could bring somebody on board um, to, to, uh, to deliver the milk for you. Now, as I said, in order to move into that tier two, there are um, additional requirements um, from the tier one. One of those is that the milk must be tested twice per month uh, by an FDA accredited lab and must meet um, specific standards uh, in order to do that. Um, and the farmer, you guys would need to make sure that those results are being sent to the Agency of Agriculture. Um, uh, there is the, a registration and an inspection requirement um, uh, that, that must also occur. So there are higher, more stringent uh, requirements for the, for the Tier 2. Um, you have a question in here. Um, in terms of insurance, I don't know um, specific companies off the top of my head. Um, I do know that there are several that do provide uh, insurance, um, and and I don't know that there is a specific requirement in the law. Maybe I'd, I'd put that out to Dan if I'm wrong about having insurance, but I, I think certainly folks that I talk to do have insurance, and some of them some of the insurance companies do um, have specific questions about um, about raw milk that uh, they need to do. Great, thanks. Um, so that's sort of the the overview uh, of the of the raw milk law and the raw milk campaign uh, that I had I had planned to chat with you guys about. Um, I guess I'm, I'm a few minutes early here, as I think we're going to end at 12:15. But I'd be happy to, um, you know, if you have additional questions for me, um, you know, go ahead and type them in. Um, if anybody else wanted to come in and make comments, uh, I'd welcome that as well. Um, otherwise, I'd, I'd thank you for being on. So feel free to type in some more questions, and, and I'd do my best to answer. Why don't I, um, while you're thinking, if you have any more questions, pop that screen up. Um, as I said, we're more than, more than willing to, to help out with uh, help out with that. Is there an option where people can buy part of a cow and hence the milk as a co-op? Uh, well, if you're if you're this specific law, I don't think discusses that that angle. Um, my understanding is under the law, if you are um, um, while selling raw milk, then you, you need to meet the raw milk law, um, which I think in, in includes um, uh, that sort of co-op uh, way of looking at it. I know that's sort of a, a unique twist on it, and, and folks have brought that up to us in the past. Um, but I don't, I don't actually have it right in front of me. But I do believe that um, the definition of sale it includes includes. Uh, um, Marketing or exchanging of, of the milk in, in, in any manner. Um. Uh, this is Dan Scruton. A, a little comment on that is if you go the route of a co-op or a cow share, some people call it, you are going to have to set up as a formal business so that you're actually formally in business with the people. It, it wouldn't be quite the same as a CSA if you want them all to own a part of the farm and therefore uh, portion of the milk. But if they, and maybe, I, I don't know if Dan, you, you want to chime in on this too, but is, if you do set it up that way, um, is it still, you still have to meet the requirements of the raw milk law? Or are you essentially exempt because each person owns that? Well, I think you still have to follow. I don't know if this is you still have to follow the 
the basic criteria of, of the law because the law is sell or barter or give the milk away. So even if it's the owners drinking their own milk, now now you're in an area, is it anything anybody's going to ever come in and enforce? And, and it's doubtful that the state's ever going to get between the owner of a cow and the milk that they drink from that cow. Um, other than the health department if somebody gets sick. So uh, technically you're still under the law and I think if you did a cow share program where you're trying to get around the 50 quarts or the 160 quart rules, I think that's where it's it's it will be a test case if it happens, but I think our position is that that, that still is uh, a sale. Yeah, and I think I think maybe the, the the one thing your question brings out, Heather, is um, whenever the legislature makes the law, um, you know, it's impossible to kind of think of every every angle, um, and and oftentimes there are vaguenesses in any law, and and you know, ultimately, it is it is it is sort of a, a situation where. Um, you don't know until it's, it's, it happens. It's sort of a test gray area situation. So, um, you know, I guess that's that's what I would say to that. Um, any other any other questions or, or comments in the next couple minutes here? Um, so, Jared, this is Jen. I'd welcome them up. And I did yes. uh, type in a question. I was thinking about oh. um, Heather's CSA model, and I'm wondering if you have any examples from existing producers and how they've been able to balance um, the the tier one limitation on a per day basis with uh, weekly customers, if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I just off the top of my head, I, I, I don't have specific examples of folks that are, are doing that. Um, I mean, I think as sort of Dan pointed out, um, it really is a daily uh, amount. That, that triggers the tier one versus tier two. Um, so as long as, as you know you're not going over that amount, I don't see why. I think it could be a good good model um, to, to use a, a, a CSA model. Um, I don't I don't uh, I don't have any specific examples of that, but I think that the, the numbers are are what they are, and that the daily the daily limits will will control how many members you could have. Uh, and how much milk each would get um, based on on uh, you know that that court exemption. So the the, the difference between um, Heather, the difference between becoming a tier one and a tier two seller is is the number of uh, is the amount. And I'll skip back to that that slide for you here. Um, but it is it's purely a an amount of milk that you are are selling from the farm. So up to 50 quarts, you're a um, you're a tier one, which means you have to meet the, the tier one requirements that we touched on. Um, if you go above the 50 quarts a day, you become a a tier two, um, which means that you you need you're, you know you're subject to the the by mother twice a month testing, uh, the inspection and the registration with the agency. Okay, so if you're selling less than 50 quarts per day, if you want to deliver milk, um, you have to meet the tier two requirements regardless of um, the amount. So if you want to deliver uh, milk as part of a CSA, um, even if you're only selling a few quarts a day, um, then, then you would need to still meet those tier two requirements. So it's sort of a, a, a twofold. If you're above above 50 quarts a day, you become tier two. You need to meet the, the additional requirements. Or if you want to deliver, you need to meet the additional requirements. Um, so that's that's the way that it it, it breaks down. But good questions. Um, any other any other questions that are coming to folks' mind? Absolutely. Let me jump in my uh, contact and email here and, and um, skip to the end again. Uh, you know, folks are welcome to get in touch with us for questions, follow up, or for um, you know getting those templates for the signs or for the uh, the labels. 
um, you know, we're here to help. And as I mentioned before, Pearl Vermont is, uh, you know, dedicated to economic justice for farmers, and and, uh, and so we're here to try to find ways to do that. This has been one of those ways. Um, and uh, I'd certainly encourage you to reach out to us if we can be, be helpful in any way in, in, in making this a little bit easier for you. I know it's, it's a lot of information. Um, probably seems daunting, maybe, uh, but, it, but I think it, it really uh, really isn't. Um, I think that um, I think there's a lot of folks that are, that are doing this and meeting these and, and having, making this a successful part of their businesses. So I'd, I'd encourage you to do it. I'd encourage you to reach out to us. Uh, if, if you want help or guidance, uh, we're certainly here uh, to provide that. Um, so you can see our contact information there. I, I jumped my email up there um, and our, our phone number and website. Uh, I guess I'd, I'd thank you all. And if, there's, if there's no further questions, then, um, then I think we're going to do a, a break. Is that correct? Yes, we are. We're going to take um, a little less than 15 minutes, and uh, we should rejoin so that Dan can start up at uh, 1230. So thank you so much, Jared, for your presentation. And thank you also, Dan, for stepping in and answering um, some additional questions. And we're going to take a short break. And just for some clarity for Heather and Megan, you can just hang on this where you are right now. You don't have to leave this site and rejoin if you want to uh, stay for Dan's presentation. Um, uh, so yeah, um, that's it. So welcome, Jess. I see you just joined us for the second part of our uh, webinar on uh, producing raw milk. Um, I would encourage you, uh, this is Jesse from UVM Extension, I'd encourage you to go through the audio setup wizard found under the tools menu at the top left of the screen. Um, it will help with your audio during the webinar, and it only takes a moment. So uh, go ahead and do that before we get started at 12.30. All right, so it is 12.30, and uh, we are going to go ahead and get started with the second part of the presentation. Um, and just a reminder to uh, use the chat box um, below the list of names there um, to type any questions you have as you go along or to answer uh, questions that might be asked of you. Um, and again, uh, welcome to this presentation. Um, from UVM, the UVM Extension Center for Sustainable Agriculture Pasture Program and the New Farmer Project webinar. Um, this is the second part of our um, webinar here, um, Best Management Practices for Raw Milk Handling, presented by Dan Scruton. And uh, Dan is the Dairy and Energy Chief for the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. He's worked for the agency for uh, 26 years and currently oversees the dairy regulatory, milk quality, and renewable energy programs for the agency. We are very fortunate to have Dan with us today. Um, welcome, Dan. Thank you. Um, while those that know me know that I would have no trouble talking for 45 minutes nonstop, it'll be much better if you ask questions. So if you've got questions, uh, feel free to type them in and, and I'll try to address them. I'm going to really cover the management practices around producing the raw milk more than the statutes themselves, but um, Jared and I could answer questions on either one. I'm going to start off with a topic that we hadn't covered in the past, and that is uh, flood concerns. Um, there have been some issues around the flooding that could affect dairy farmers, and that would be whether you're shipping your raw milk directly to consumers or, or selling it through a co-op. So I just thought I'd hit some of the highlights, uh, and there is information. UVM extension would be the point of contact for most of you to, to get that information. Um, we are following up, and it's still a, a work in progress uh, as far as exactly what's going to be happening. But there are a number of concerns after a flood. 
Uh, one is mycotoxins. Really, that's just mold. If you do stored feeds, you can get some mold issues, and there are some molds that are more harmful than others. Uh, heavy metals, because a number of municipal waste treatment facilities were overcome during the flood, and so the flood waters do contain some things that normal flood waters would not contain. Again, pathogenic bacteria, both from stirring up the mud and sediment in the in the river, as well as from the waste treatment streams. Um, there are a number of them that would be concerned to raw milk producers. Clostridium would be one that you certainly, if you have pastures that have been flooded, you want to talk to your veterinarian about. There is some vaccinations that you may want to do. Um, pesticides. Uh, just There's a lot of soil that was eroded away that um, hasn't moved for a long time. PCBs, which are transformer oils uh, that may have been at sites where it was stored. So there are a number of concerns. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, just that you really need to be aware that if you're going to harvest uh, crops that have been in the floodwaters, then you're assuming some liability when you do that, and you really want to go above and beyond in the management practices, harvesting those, and primarily important, keep them segregated from the rest of your harvested crops so that if there's an issue, you can figure out which ones are from the flooded fields. Um, one thing on hay, you want to avoid harvesting heavily silted hay crops. I know that this year it's going to be short on feed, but um, there, there are some bigger issues at play with the health of the animals. Um, again, if you do harvest it, keep it separate. Um, there is a high risk for poor fermentation if you're going to make haylage or baleage or, or any kind of silage. That's, that's going to be a primary concern. There are things that can be done to mitigate it. There again, talk to extension and monitor your animals closely and work with your veterinarian. Uh, pastures. There, there were a lot of pastures that were flooded. Um, again, it depends on what was upstream from your pasture, just which issues are a concern. Um, extension can help you evaluate just what the concerns are. Here's, here's a list of what some of the concerns are. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I just wanted to get this information out there to make sure people are at least thinking about it. And if at all possible, the safest thing to do is just not graze contaminated pastures till next spring. And I'll leave this one up for just a minute, but it's mainly because this is a webinar so people can come back and, and look at this again later. Uh, these, are the, these are the crop and farm specialists that are doing uh, a lot of the work with the flooded fields and flooded crops. If you don't um, remember these numbers, don't worry about it. Go through your local extension office and any of them then can steer you to it, or Jen Kobe or, or Jessica here online. Either one of them can get you in contact with these people as well. Uh, but the main thing is just remember that if you're going to use flooded crops, you really need to go in with both eyes open and, and evaluate what you're going to be doing. So now, on to basic milk quality. Basic milk quality is not all that difficult, but there are some things that you need to do. And we talk about it as a five-point plan. And on the number one is clean, dry, comfortable, well-nourished cattle. I know all the cows in Vermont stay clean and clipped up and in nice pens like this one. Uh, but even in the reality, if you can keep it clean and dry and the cows comfortable and well nourished, you're going to go a long ways towards making high quality milk. Healthy cows, it, it may seem basic, but you need to make sure your cows are, are healthy and that the people milking the cows are healthy. Because a, a number of the disease outbreaks over the years with raw milk have been from people that are, are ill themselves and, and pass disease into the milk. 
or the animals can be sick. Either, either way, you can have problems. Ventilation. The air, especially this is more of a winter issue than a summer issue, but you really need a well-ventilated area. Cows don't mind cold near as much as they mind moisture. So keep, keep the barn ventilated well enough so that it's comfortable for the cattle. That may be a little colder than is comfortable for you working with them, but the um, cow's health is what's most important. In hot weather, you need air movement through the barn when the cattle are in the barn for fly control and a number of issues. Milking procedures. Number one, milk clean, dry animals. And that can't be overstressed. If, if the cows are out and they've been in the mud and they're dirty, it's very difficult to get them clean enough that you're going to get clean milk. So it works best if you can keep the animals clean and dry. If you can't, then you need to do whatever it takes to get them clean. But after you wash them and get them clean, you need to get them dry before you milk them. Pre-dip. Uh, Pre-dip is just you take a tea dip product, generally it's the same dip product that you use at the end, and you disinfect the teats. The reason pre-dip works so much better than just washing with uh, a towel with a sanitizer on it is iodine mixed up in a solution to use as a sanitizer is 25 to 50 parts per million of iodine. Iodine in a teat dip solution is 2,500 to 10,000 parts per million of iodine. So it's much more iodine, but it's in a skin lotion type base so that it doesn't hurt the animal's teats. But it does an excellent job of sanitizing and killing any bacteria that may be on the outside of the teat. You want to check the four milk. And by that, that's just you take a squirt or two of milk out before you start milking to save the milk. And do this with the dip on. That works the sanitizer into your hands. It works it into the animal's teeth. It really does a nice job of sanitizing. Sanitizers take about 30 seconds to work. So after it's been on for about 30 seconds, then you can wipe the dip off with a single service towel or a laundered towel, as long as it's cleaned and dried between each use. And then you put on the milking unit. So just some, some basic. Uh, steps. After the animal's done milking, and the milk flow is significantly slowed, shut the vacuum off, remove the milking unit. You don't need to get every little last bit of milk. They used to think that if you didn't get all the milk out, that there would still be milk in there and the cow would make mil less milk the next time. And they found that really isn't the case, that you're better off to under milk a little bit than you are to over milk because when you over milk that's when you irritate the the mammary gland and after you take the milking unit off again dip the animal's teeth with a disinfectant to reduce any organisms that that may have gotten on from the milking machine good milking equipment Milking machines touch all of the milk, so use use a good one. And it does that's where all your cash flow is coming through. So that isn't the place to cut corners. It wants to be designed to effectively remove the milk without harming the cows or goats or sheep, whatever livestock you're milking. Uh, Dairy Practices Council is a group uh, made up of uh, regulators, extension and university folks, and industry folks that get together and write guidelines for the dairy industry. And there are a number of them on, on milking machines and milking systems, as well as um, teat dips and a wide variety of, of dairy issues. You need stable vacuum, good pulsation, because you don't want the milk splashing back up against the cow's teeth once it gets down into the milking unit. Because in the milking unit is not going to be sterile. Whereas inside of the cow, it, it is sterile. Um, and that's one of the misnomers that sometimes people talk about with raw milk. They talk about pasteurization having killed all the good bacteria. Well, milk when it comes out of the cow, unless the cow is infected, 
the milk coming out of that animal is sterile. It does not have any bacteria in it to start with. Any bacteria are contaminants. Milking machines work very simple. Upper left picture, you've got an inflation open. The vacuum on the pulsator is drawing vacuum out of, from around the inflation. The inflation opens. The vacuum draws the milk out of the teeth. When the pulsator lets air in, it collapses the liner and forms a massage phase, which keeps keeps the teeth supple and keeps fluids from gathering in the end of the teeth and causing teeth damage. It's backwards from hand milking, where you, some people think that a milking machine works like a hand milker, where when you squeeze it, you get the milk out. Well, in reality, it's just the opposite. It's when you don't squeeze it that you get the milk out. Vacuum lines. PVC is relatively inexpensive, so I wouldn't put in any vacuum lines that are less than two inch, even if I was putting in a system for, for one animal. If it had vacuum lines, two inch is just much easier to keep clean. It's easier to inspect. If it does get dirty, you can get in there and clean it. Um, so I'd go with two inch lines. You want them all to slope to somewhere where they can be drained and drain them on a regular basis. And a good idea is just put T's on the corners of any long straight runs so that you can look in and make sure that things are clean. Another big mistake, it's a, probably a little difficult to see in the picture, but if you see those circles, the vacuum taps are coming down off the bottom of that vacuum line. That one is a big mistake. That will give you bacteria counts almost every time because you get condensation in those vacuum lines and it will run down through that hose and even though there's a check valve in the claw, you're going to have a problem with um, moisture and condensation getting down in. Vacuum gauges. You really need an accurate vacuum gauge because the vacuum level on the teeth is critical when it comes to how um, how much damage you might do to a cow if it's if it's in the wrong level. There's about a two inch range that you normally would milk within, and if you get outside of that range, you're either so low that the units are going to be slipping, squawking, and it takes too long to milk, and if you get too high you're going to pull too much fluid into the end of those teats and actually damage the animal's teats. You really should check that vacuum level every day, change the inflations at recommended intervals. On typical black rubber liners, that's around 1,200 milkings. Silicone will typically go 5,000. And, and you may need to change them more often if you're only milking one or two animals and you don't get very many milkings in for each washing. So that's something where you want to have a milking equipment dealer come in and look and check um, about every 1,200 hours. Dan, this is Jen. Of, May I ask you a quick operation. question on the previous slide? Um, talking about the vacuum Some quick levels and needing to check yes. them on a regular basis, as, as I understand it, the yep. law covers also sheep and goats as well. Um, and I just want to confirm. Are the are the vacuum levels different for sh uh, milking sheep or goats versus milking a cow? Do they need the same vacuum level to get the milk out? Um, what's your recommendation recommendation on that? Right, the vacuum level is going to be different because the vacuum level is set on on basically how how thick the teeth is and the muscle in the teat and how much milk is in the teat at a given time. So for sheep, goats, and cows, cows would have the highest vacuum level. Goats run about a half an inch less than cows and sheep run about a half an inch less than goats. And what that means is, is on a bucket milking system, a cow is going to be around 10 and a half to 12 and a half inches of vacuum. A goat's going to be around 10 to 12 inches of vacuum, and a sheep's going to be around 9.5 to 11.5. Um, hand milking is legal. It's permissible. Um, 
I'm, I'm reading a question now. And for, for a few animals, that probably is the preferred method. The challenge with hand milking is keeping um, sawdust and litter and things that are on the animal's belly from getting into the bucket. So it's even more important to not just clean the animal's teats, but um, some people would even just brush the belly of the animal to make sure there aren't things that are going to fall into the pail. Because uh, your milk filter should be a backup system, not, not a primary system. But hand milking certainly is, is permissible. Um, if you have a, a vacuum operated milking system, a few quick and easy tests that, that you can do just to make sure that the system's in the ballpark. If you have more than one milking cluster, when you flip one, it shouldn't drop the vacuum more than a, a half an inch. The reason it's 0.6 is that comes out even in metric. It's the international standards are 2 kPa, which is the same as 0.6 inches of vacuum. Um, Pulsators, the easiest thing to do is just put it on your cheek. Pull the pulsator hose off the cloth, put it on your cheek, and the vacuum should fully release on each stroke. So it should go to zero on each stroke, and it will release from your cheek. And that means the pulsator is turning on and off, at least in the ballpark. And the equipment, of course, needs to be visibly clean. Play in drug therapies. I mean, animals do occasionally get sick. Um, and I'll get to Megan's question in just a second. Um, the main thing on, on treating animals is you really need a good relationship with your veterinarian. And if you treat under the raw milk rules, any, any cow that, or goat or sheep that gets um, treated, before you can sell that milk again, you need an FDA approved test to clear to make sure that that drug is cleared. And probably the easiest way to do that is going to be to partner up with some of the conventional farms in the area and send it through your co-op, through their co-op, or get it to the state lab or, or to a, in a facility that can do it. You can do the tests yourself. You can buy them. But generally, if you're not going to do very many, you're better off to have someone else do it. Uh, now we have a question from Megan on best to clean and sanitize equipment. All right, I believe I'm going to answer that question. Um, if I don't, I'll I'll come back to it. Uh, on treatment plans, again, like I said, working with your veterinarian, it is going to make a difference what type of animal. I mean, mastitis can happen in any of them. Goats can get CAE. Any of them can get listeria, brucellosis, or TB. And it's just important to keep clear records. And you want to think about farm visitors, especially farm visitors who come from other farms, to make sure they're not bringing anything with them, so to speak, to the farm. Uh, prudent culling. Here's one people don't think about. But if you have an animal that gets mastitis and keeps coming back with mastitis several times in the same lactation, it's probably time to get rid of that animal because it's going to be very difficult to treat and clear that up. So while some people, I remember we had one cow on my folks' farm. It was the last living cow with my mother's prefix. She had grown up with cattle as well. And that cow was staying around. Us boys could come and go, but the cow was going to stay. Uh, so it's OK to have pets. Just know that that's a pet, not a, trying to be a working animal. All right. Um, all right, we're going to get into cleaning. So on Megan's question on, on treatment advice, one, that's where you need to talk to a veterinarian. There have been studies done on frequent complete milking out of the animal versus using antibiotics. And for some types of mastitis, it's, it is very effective. Um, for other types, it isn't going to work. So that's where working with your veterinarian to get an idea of what type of mastitis you're working with to see if that's one where that um, would be an effective treatment or not um, would be the way to, to answer that. All right, cleaning milking equipment. 
One of the most important things is to do it right after you get done milking. Because if you let the milk dry onto a stainless steel surface, it's much harder to get it cleaned off than if right after you get done milking, you, you do the dishes, so to speak, and clean them up. Uh, you want to wash all the surfaces, not, and don't forget the vacuum hoses. And the way to do that is you're going to rinse with a gallon of tepid water. Tepid water would be room temperature, uh, body temperature of the cow. The idea is that you want to rinse with, with water that's about the same temperature as the milk was so that the fats and proteins that are in the milk uh, will be rinsed off as, as completely as practical. If you're using a bucket milker, that would typically be a gallon of water that you're just going to rinse into the bucket, turn the vacuum off, swish it around, and, and dump it out. Then you go into the wash cycle. The wash cycle, now this is assuming hand washing. If you're going to do, if you're large enough that you have a CIP washing system, the temperatures will be much higher. But you need to use an alkaline dairy cleaner not dishwashing liquid. If you use dishwashing liquid, the proteins are going to build up and you're, and you're going to have problems. So you want to buy real dairy cleaners to clean the stainless steel and completely dismantle the machine, immerse all the parts except for the pulsator in the solution, scrub them, clean them up, and remove all traces of, of soils. Immediately after washing, you want to rinse all the parts with tepid water acidified to a pH of around 3. They have acid rinses that it's not very concentrated. It's typically about an ounce to 10 gallons of water. And what the acid does is it, it will both stop the alkaline action of the, of the soap and it lowers the pH on the surface to allow or, or to discourage bacterial growth and at the same time the acid will move any milk stones that may be accumulating before they get um, thick enough to be a problem. And in order to do all that, the sanitary regulations require a two compartment sink. Now with the raw milk rules, it's it's not quite as clear. You just have to show that you can get them clean. So if you're shipping milk conventionally, you know that you need a two compartment sink plus a hand wash sink in your milk room. If you're just doing raw milk, it, the rules aren't quite as clear, but the purpose is it's clearly in the statute. You need to be able to get them clean, and it's very difficult to do that if you do not have a two compartment sink to wash in. Storage. After rinsing, take the dismantled parts on suitable racks and, and have them drain and dry. Hang the vacuum hoses so they drain. That's the main thing is allow them to drain and, and dry out between milkings. And store pails inverted on racks so that things don't land in the pail or, or they pu or pool. So it's important for drainage and in a clean place. Sanitizer. Now you're just getting ready to milk the next time. You go put your milking unit together. You sanitize by flushing a dairy sanitizer. And the way you'd know it's a dairy sanitizer, it'll have an EPA registration that it's a sanitizer. And follow the label directions for the right concentration for time and temperature for that sanitizer. Milk samples. Jared mentioned that one of the regulations that, that are in statute is that every day that you collect bottle milk to sell, you need to pull a sample of milk that's a homogeneous blend. That just means it's, it's a mixture of all of the milk that you produce. Don't just take the milk from one animal and freeze it. It wants to be the commingled milk. Now, if you're only milking one animal and you're bottling milk each milking, then it may just be one animal and you need to pull a sample each milking. But essentially, every time you fill containers, you want to pull a sample and freeze it. And I recommend that you pull at least two samples. The rules only require that you pull one sample. But they, for your own safety, 
you want to pull two samples so that if there's a problem and you have a fire, if someone gets sick and you need to go back to uh, those samples, the state is going to want one of those samples. That's what the requirement's for. So if someone gets sick, the health department has a sample of milk that they can test. The other one is to protect you. That's why I would always pull two, because your insurance company is probably also going to want a sample of milk that they can test if someone gets sick. So I would pull two samples and freeze them. But the requirement is just one. Just be, realize you can't do anything with that sample other than keep it frozen for the two weeks and turn it over to the state if something happens and they need it. Um, you want to label the sample container before you put the milk in. It's very difficult to label a wet container. Um, you want to make sure your hands are clean and dry using a single service towel when you when you do that. You want to sanitize the sampling dipper and then rinse the sam sampling dipper at least twice with milk. So you're going to dip her in and kind of slosh the milk around in the pail or bucket or whatever you're sampling from and, and just empty the dipper two or three times into the milk. Then pull it up out, fill your sample container and, um, and then freeze it. And where you're freezing the sample, never fill the sample container full. On rigid vials, there's a line about three quarters of the way up. And that's the most you want to do it, because milk will expand when it freezes. If you're using a world bag, it isn't quite as important. But they don't need a lot of milk to do this testing. An ounce or two of milk is all that you need to keep. You want to make sure that it's a representative sample. Like I said, you don't want it more than three quarters full. Don't put whatever milk's left in the dipper back into the tank. Once it comes out of the with the dipper, put it into the sample container or discard it. Um, you want to rinse and wash and store your dipper in a clean place, and then place the sample in the freezer. And it's really important to keep that dipper clean, be, otherwise, it um, you're going to end up with samples that may be contaminated and might not have anything to do with your milk if the sample container, uh, if the sample dipper or the container is contaminated. If you're tier two, and which means either you're, you're delivering milk or you're selling over the 50 quarts a day, you will need to take milk month, twice a month to a lab for quality tests. Wants to be transported in an ice bath with the ice and water at about 50-50, and that protects the sample from freezing. Um, you need to send a filled container of the size you are selling to the consumer. So if you're selling quarts of milk, you need to take a whole quart of milk to the lab. And the reason for that is under the statute, it's the farmer's responsibility that the bottles are clean. And the way to test for that is we're going to test the container, milk and all. And if that passes, then that means the container was clean enough and the milk was clean enough. Uh, if you use the state lab, they do require an appointment. Um, for those that haven't heard, the state lab is shut down right now. Um, so right now, we're we are in a holding pattern. We're going to be sending. We're lining up to send the samples out to another lab. So we're going to find a lab to get the samples to that's out of state, so the producers don't have to go out of state. But we'll do those transports. Um, so this phone number is not the accurate one right now, but it hopefully will be in a couple of months when the lab starts back up. For right now, call the dairy office. That would be 802. 828-2433. The required testing at the state lab, it's about $25 to do the whole set of tests. Somatic cell count for cattle or sheep, it needs to be under 225,000. For goats, it can be up to 500,000. And the reason for that is that during rut, goats naturally have an elevation in somatic cell count. So the, the standard just recognizes that.
the grade A milk standard also has a higher standard for goats because it recognizes that during rut, goats have some issues that aren't related to mastitis. The total bacteria count needs to be under 15,000. The total coliform count under 10 colony forming units. And there will be an antibiotic test that's run on the milk that's valid for the type of livestock that the milk sample represents. Optional testing the lab can do that you may or may not want, it's up to you, is, is butterfat protein, solids non-fat. Cryoscope is just added water. Um, it, it's the freeze point of the milk that tells how your milk compares to other milk uh, from a percent water basis. Washing the bottles. The, you want to wash the containers similar to, to the stainless units. You want to wash in an alkaline dairy detergent. Don't try washing the bottles in, in regular dishwashing soap because you will get protein buildups. Use an acid rinse, drain and dry, sanitize prior to filling, but make sure that you drain the containers completely before you fill them. So it's very similar to washing the milking equipment. And finally, anything and everything that contacts the milk really needs to be washed, rinsed, sanitized, and well drained. You don't want water dripping into the milk from your hands or from a milking unit or from anywhere else. And it needs to be cooled to at least 40 degrees within two hours of when you get done milking and maintained there until it is obtained by the consumer. Questions? If you have milk quality issues, we do have a milk quality troubleshooter that works for the agency of ag that would come out to the farm at no cost and help you work through those. His name's Laurel Junkins. His phone number and email address are up here. Sue James is the head farm inspector. If you've got some inspection questions, or you can contact myself. So, uh, Dan, this is Jen, and rather than section. typing this question, I'll just ask it. Um, so do I was have wondering any if you would questions? mind uh, going back a couple of slides to the the different tests, the somatic cell count, and the coliform, and just describe a little bit more about um, what those tests mean, what those counts mean. Um, if a if a farmer is faced with an elevated somatic cell, how is that different than um, a coliform count or a total bacteria? Okay, somatic cell count is. Somatic cell, most of the time that's white blood cells that are in the milk, and it's indicative of the infection status of the, of the udder. So if the somatic cell count is elevated uh, much above these levels, then it's a sign that there is mastitis present. So there'd be a pathogen that's causing the mastitis that would be present in the milk, and that's why these standards are in place and that's why they're lower than, say, the grade A milk standards for farms that are selling their milk that's going to be pasteurized because the pathogen issue is a different question in milk that's going to be pasteurized than milk that's going to be directly consumed. Total bacteria count, that's, that's a total of all of the contaminants that are in the milk. As I said, in the memory, it would be zero. Uh, milk in an uninfected animal has no bacteria count. Um, so it's a level of how much has gone kind of wrong in the production process that uh, contaminated the milk. Coliform count is more specific. That would be bacteria that, I mean, it can be mastitis. It, an animal can get mastitis from coliform and shed those coliform organisms along with the mastitis, but typically the somatic cell count and the coliform count would be elevated at the same time. Most of the time, coliform counts are from fecal contamination, uh, which we really don't like to talk about, but it does happen. Uh, the udder is right underneath where something else comes out. So um, coliform counts are largely an, in, an indicator of, of some of the basic hygiene issues. And then the antibiotic test is just test to see if there are any uh, bacterial inhibitors in the milk.
Now, one thing that Jared and I, neither one, talked yes, about, please. but I'd be glad to if somebody wants to, is is uh, the cheese classes. That really is what precipitated the changes in statute this last year. Okay, the the issue that came up last year was the the original Act 62 said the milk could only be sold for fluid consumption. And if it could only be sold for fluid consumption, then a farmer couldn't knowingly sell it to somebody that was going to make it into cheese. And in talking with the legislature, that really, it seemed to be that at least with some of the legislators, that was their intent. In others, it wasn't. So there was a, a, a debate this year. And as Jared said, with the agency and rural Vermont working together, we came up with a change in definition. So now raw milk can be sold for personal consumption. And personal consumption would be used by um, a, a person, their household, and non-paying guests. So it still keeps it from the commercial realm, but what you do at home with the milk, you can make it into cheese, you can make it into butter or whatever you want to make it into. You can't sell those products, but you can consume them yourself. So now that that change is in place, classes can be held that basically are in line with the intent of the statute. That was the verbal agreement that, that Rural Vermont and the agency and the legislature came up with. So if a farmer wants to hold one at the farm and you know, they, it would be the same regulations basically as, as selling the raw milk. You, you need to keep treat all of the people coming to the class as if they were customers, so to speak. And then the class can be held and you can make whatever kind of dairy products you want. They can consume them and uh, so that people can be taught how to properly make cheese and other products from the raw milk. It looks like Jared uh, had to log off, so thank you very much for clarifying that. Yeah, um, I think that Jared may want to weigh in on that, but that's that's essentially what the change was last year. Um, the other issue that hasn't changed but occasionally comes up is you still cannot do raw milk cheese classes, let's say at a at a farmer's market, and and give away the cheese. Um, it, it's very limited in where you can do it and and what you can do, and what personal consumption is. So. As uh, if somebody buys your milk and makes it into cheese, they can't then take it to the church supper, so to speak, and and share it with everyone because that's not personal consumption. It's not done in their home, so to speak. So there are still limitations. But uh, there's it, a question in the chat box care of the about uh, New Hampshire and Maine and farmers selling bottled raw milk in those stores. Uh, is that possible in Vermont as well? Any other questions? I see that. Uh, no, in in Vermont, it's not allowed to sell it in stores unless depends on your definition of stores, I guess. You couldn't put it in the local grocery store, um, but a farmer that has his own farm stand or her own farm stand can sell their raw milk at their farm stand. They can't take it to their neighbor's farm stand and sell it, but as long as it's on the same, as long as it's the same farm so as where the milk is produced, any more questions, that would be um, permissible. I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank Dan for presenting today, and um, please encourage uh, anyone who has not put their email address into the chat box to do so um, for a quick follow-up survey and additional information in the future. And uh, Thank you all very much for taking part today.
Thank you for pulling it all together.